This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 58. Coming up on Space Time. New evidence suggests the sun's rotation could influence lightning on Earth. A dozen new moons discovered orbiting around Jupiter. And a quadrillion tons of diamonds hidden deep in the Earth. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests the sun's rotational cycle influences lightning activity on Earth. The findings, reported in Annales Geophysica, are based on an unusual source, Japanese diaries dating back to the 1700s. Scientists have long known that long-term centennial and even millennial-scale variations in solar activity can influence terrestrial climate on Earth. And before we go any further, these changes are separate from the anthropological climate change now being caused by the human use of fossil fuels. However, what's not well understood is whether or not the sun influences daily or monthly weather and climate on Earth. Scientists looked at the sun's 27-day solar rotational period, which is the average time it takes our local star to complete one full rotation on its axis. And since the sun consists of plasma, its equator does rotate quicker than the poles. When areas of high solar activity such as sunspots face Earth, there's a corresponding increase in ultraviolet rays and an equally corresponding decrease in energetic particles showering Earth's atmosphere. The authors wanted to see if this 27-day cycle is reflected in meteorological phenomena such as lightning activity on Earth. So they turned to an unusual source for their reference, a set of diaries kept continuously for more than 150 years. A rural farming family in Hakoji, a formerly rural region located in what is now western Tokyo, kept a set of diaries known as the Diary of the Ishikawa Family, while another set of diaries, known as the Diary of the Horasaki Clan Government Office, kept a detailed log of events collected by civil servants from Horasaki who were residents of central Tokyo. The two locations are about 70 kilometres apart. The research team examined the records for mentions of thunder and lightning events between May and September, when the influence from the cold Siberian air mass is weak in Japan. Amazingly, they found peaks of lightning and thunder activity roughly every 24 to 31 days, the same time window it takes sunspots to rotate completely. The authors say it's a strong signal, especially when the yearly average number of sunspots is high. They say it indicates the cyclic behaviour of the sun is playing an important role in changes in weather in Japan, with the rhythm of lightning activity amplifying as the level of solar activity increases. The authors now plan to study the detailed mechanism of solar influence on meteorological events and analyse how the impact of solar activity might propagate in Japan. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A dozen new moons have been discovered orbiting Jupiter. The findings bring to 79 the number of official moons now known to be orbiting the solar system's largest planet, and that's more than any other body in the solar system. The new discoveries include 11 so-called normal or outer moons, and one which scientists are calling a real oddball. Astronomers first spotted these new moons back in 2017, while they were looking for very distant solar system objects as part of the hunt for a possible massive planet 9 beyond Pluto. Nine of the new moons are part of a distant outer swarm of moons which orbit the gas giant in retrograde, that is, in the opposite direction to Jupiter's spin rotation. These distant retrograde moons are grouped into three very distinct orbital groupings. They're thought to be the remnants of three larger parent bodies that probably broke apart during collisions with comets, asteroids or other Jovian moons. The newly discovered retrograde moons take about two Earth years to complete each orbit around Jupiter. Another two of the new discoveries are part of a group of closer inner moons that orbit in prograde, that is, in the same direction as the planet's rotation. These inner prograde moons all have similar orbital distances and similar angles of inclination around Jupiter, and so are also thought to be fragments of a larger moon that broke apart. These two newly discovered moons take a little less than an Earth year to complete one orbit around Jupiter. And now we come to the final moon in this newly discovered group, and scientists say it's a real oddball, with an orbit like no other known Jovian moon. 
It could also be Jupiter's smallest known moon, being less than a kilometre in diameter. The new eyeball moon is more distant and more inclined than the prograde group of moons and takes about a year and a half to complete each Jovian orbit. So, unlike the closer in prograde group of moons, this new oddball prograde moon actually has an orbit which crosses the path of the outer retrograde moons. And of course, what all that means is that a head-on collision is far more likely to occur between the new oddball prograde moon and its neighbouring retrograde moons, which are all moving in the opposite direction. The authors think this small oddball prograde moon could be the last remaining remnant of a once larger prograde orbiting moon that formed some of Jupiter's retrograde moon groupings during past head-on collisions. Understanding the complex influences that shaped the moon's orbital history can teach scientists a lot about the solar system's early history. For example, the discovery that the smallest moons in Jupiter's various orbital groups are still abundant suggests that the collisions that created them occurred after the era of planetary formation, when the Sun was still surrounded by a rotating disk of gas and dust from which the planets were born. You see, because of their sizes, between 1 and 3 kilometres, these moons are far more influenced by surrounding gas and dust. If these raw materials had still been present when Jupiter's first generation of moons collided to form its current clustered groupings of moons, the drag exerted by any remaining gas and dust on the smaller moons would have been sufficient to cause them to spiral inwards towards Jupiter. So their existence shows that they had likely formed after this gas and dust had dissipated. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Department of Science. The new moons of Jupiter... What gives, Fred? Complete accidents, actually. Uh, not the moons themselves, but their discovery. So it's one of these cases where astronomers were looking for something else and, and they found something different from what mm. they were looking for. So this is with a telescope in Chile called the Blanco Telescope. It's very similar in size and shape, actually, to our Anglo-Australian telescope, the 3.9-metre telescope at Siding Spring observatory in northwestern New South Wales, not that far from where you live. But the Blanco telescope is, as I said, a similar telescope in Chile, and it has this extraordinary wide-angle digital camera. So it's a bit like the camera in your phone, only about a thousand times bigger. And that's used actually for all kinds of survey work. And in particular, the astronomers who were using it, uh, a group from the Carnegie Institution, were looking for very distant solar system asteroids, things out in the, the Kuiper belt there beyond the orbit of Neptune, the place we, things we call trans-Neptunian objects. Mm -hmm. We know that there's a whole belt of asteroids out there. There's about a thousand of them known. Pluto is one of the bigger ones. It's one of the reasons why Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet back in 2006. So they were carrying out a survey looking for these things, but suddenly realized that um, the planet Jupiter was not very far away from their field of view. And they suddenly started picking up moons of Jupiter, moons of Jupiter that were previously unknown. Mm. And uh, these are really interesting ones. So they, they've discovered 12 new ones. That brings the total number of moons of Jupiter that are currently known to 79. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, it is a lot. Yeah, when I was when I was a lad, we thought Jupiter had 12 moons. That was it. That was all, yeah. all new. With the very best telescopes in the world. Now we've discovered, you know, 12 more on to bring the total to 79. But they're really interesting ones because they, first of all, most of them orbit a long way from Jupiter. They've got periods of revolution about Jupiter of about a year. In fact, some of them more than a year. So really slow moving objects quite distant from their parent planet. But another group of them, or one of the significant groups of these moons, are in what are called retrograde orbits. That means they're going backwards. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. So in the solar system, pretty well everything, not entirely everything, but most things, if you looked, uh, looked at them from above the North Pole, they'd be going anti-clockwise. That's mm. the preferred direction of the solar system. That's the, the fossil rotation of the swirling gas cloud from which the solar system formed. But um, several of these, I think something like nine of them, are going around in what we call prograde orbits. Uh, a big part what we call retrograde orbits, which are, which are backwards, and that means they're going clockwise. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but clockwise is backwards in the world of astronomy. Yeah. But intriguingly, there is one little fella, and this object is no more than a kilometre 
in diameter. So it's probably diameter is probably the wrong word for it. It's probably just you know a lump of a, a lump of rock, which is it's in a, a prograde orbit. What that means is it's going the right direction. It's going uh, anti-clockwise, but it's right in the middle of this bunch that are going the other way. Oh my word. Yeah, it's named Valetudo, uh, Valetudo. Uh, in this is um, Roman mythology. It's one of the daughters of Jupiter and the Roman goddess of hygiene and personal health. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> that just proves beyond reasonable doubt they're running out of names. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it proves that the, it proves that the Romans had too much time on that. That's true <laughs> too. Who can we worship this week? Oh, what about hygiene? Let's go yeah, for hygiene that. and personal health. Next week we'll we'll do toothbrushes. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Well, that's a good one. Um... <laughs> so um, the bottom line with uh, Valetudo is that it might not last very long uh, yes. because it's it's in the middle of this swarm of things coming the other way. So there's and... a chance that I mean, you said it was quite small. There's a chance that it was bigger at some stage that's by the sound exactly... of it. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, that's the theory that perhaps all we're seeing is the, the last bit of debris of something that was much bigger mm. and basically collided with these these objects coming the other way. Wow. So, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. We, you know, are, are intrigued to find that uh, Jupiter is still producing surprises. When I saw this news story the other day, Andrew, I was at uh, first sight, I thought oh, this must be from the Juno spacecraft. It, you know, it must be a discovery made by Juno, but it's not. It's a, it's made by Earth-based telescopes. And I think it's pretty neat that a telescope in Chile can spot something a kilometre across at a distance of half a billion kilometres away. It tells you just how sensitive modern astronomical detectors are and how effective they are at picking up these distant things. And of course, they're detected through their motion through space. That's how you find objects like, well, solar system objects generally tend to move in front of the background of stars, mm. albeit not very fast, but the it was the motion of these moons that picked them out as moons of Jupiter rather than just, you know, stars in the background sky. And, <clears throat> and yet Juno, which is right there, didn't see any of them. But then again... No, but partly because it's not looking for them. It's Well, it's, yes. Uh, and it focused would have, very firmly on the planet itself is, is Juno. Yeah, it would have failed the gorilla test. Uh, <laughs> Do you know the gorilla test? Just remind me. This was a test that I, I actually fell for oh, it myself. Oh, that's right. Um, where where uh, you, you're told to watch something that's happening <laughs> that's in front right. of you. Yeah. And while this is going on, a guy walks suit. through in a gorilla suit and yeah. then they say, did you see the guy in the gorilla suit? And yeah. you, you say no. And it yeah. just it shows how selective your brain is in, ter in interpreting data right in front of your face. And I watched this on a documentary on TV and um, when they said to the audience that was in the studio how many saw the gorilla, about three people put their hands up. And then they yeah. showed the video again and I went, oh, my God, that's yeah. a gorilla. But I never saw so, it. So obvious, that's so right. Juno yeah. failed the gorilla test. I have seen that. Um, yes. But, uh, yeah, have they given names to all of these moons? Um, I'm not sure about most of them. Um, normally with moons like this, you know, little objects, you give them, you basically give them numbers. Um, the Astronomical Sunday. Union's going to be going crazy. They haven't been yeah, busy they, they for they a will. long time. Yeah. I haven't <laughs> seen the list of the other moons. But just going back to maybe their origin, it seems very likely that... Captured? Uh, yes, exactly. Oh, and I I'm getting better more. and better at this. I need to I'd say no more <laughs> because, so, because they, you know, the group that are going retrograde, going backwards, they're almost certainly captured objects, objects mm. that Jupiter swept up as it's in passing through clouds of cosmic debris, of which there's not very much left because it swept most of it up. Could this be how the rings formed? Um, yes, possibly, because the, the rings of both Jupiter and Saturn, actually all the giant planets have got rings. Of course, the most prominent ones are Saturn's. Jupiter's are a bit faint, as are the others. But they are almost certainly, I mean, the, the jury's still out, but I think it's fairly well the standard model that these formed from something that got too near and the tidal forces of the respective giant planets just pulled them to pieces. Mm. And so you get this, this ring of debris. What's interesting about the rings, though, and particularly the rings of Saturn, is how narrow they are in a sort of vertical direction because the, the gravity of, of the planet just pulls them into this into this shape uh, where they are like a blade of debris fly, yeah. uh, flying around. They're only 100 metres thick or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, it makes some beautiful pictures, though. Mm. They do indeed, absolutely. That's astronomer Dr Fred Watson from the Department of Science speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister programme, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
There may be more than a quadrillion tons of diamonds hidden deep below the Earth's surface. The findings, reported in the journal Geochemistry, Geophysics and Geosystems, suggest that up to 2% of the Earth's oldest mantle could be made of diamond. But these new results aren't likely to set off any sort of diamond rush, at least not in the foreseeable future. You see, scientists estimate the precious gems are buried more than 160 kilometres below the surface, far deeper than any drilling expedition has ever reached. It seems the ultra-deep cache is scattered within cratonic roots, the oldest and most immovable sections of rock that lie deep beneath the centres of most continental tectonic plates. Shaped like inverted mountains, cratons can stretch down to over 300 kilometres beneath the planet's surface and deep into its mantle. One of the study's authors, Ulrich Fowl from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, says the findings show that diamonds may not be the rare exotic gems people think of, but rather a relatively common mineral on geological scales. Fowl and colleagues discovered their diamond cache in seismic data anomalies. The US Geological Survey and other institutions pick up seismic activity from earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, explosions and other ground-shaking events globally. The speeds and intensities of these events help seismologists determine where an earthquake originated. Geologists can also use the seismic data to construct an image of what the Earth's interior looks like. You see, seismic waves move at different speeds through different strata, depending on the temperature, the density and the composition of the rocks through which they're travelling. Scientists have used this relationship between seismic activity and rock composition to estimate the type of rocks that make up the Earth's crust and upper mantle, collectively known as the lithosphere. However, the seismic data has shown a curious anomaly. It seems seismic waves tend to speed up significantly when passing through the roots of ancient cratons. Cratons are known to be colder and less dense than the surrounding olivine-dominated upper mantle, which would in turn yield significantly faster sound waves but the thing is they wouldn't be quite as fast as what's being measured. To try and find out what's going on, the authors developed three-dimensional models of seismic wave velocities as they pass through different minerals in the Earth's major cratons. They found the models best reproduced what the seismometers were recording with a craton root composition comprising the dominant upper mantle mineral peridotite with minor amounts of eclidite representing subducted oceanic crust and up to 2% diamond. That's at least a thousand times more diamond than previously expected. Cratons are a tiny bit less dense than their surroundings, so they don't get subducted back into the earth, but instead stay floating on top of the mantle. That's how they preserve the oldest rocks. Fowl says the composition of cratonic roots made partly of diamond does make sense. See, diamonds are forged in the high-pressure, high-temperature environment of the deep earth and they only ever make it to the surface through volcanic eruptions that may only occur every few tens of millions of years. These eruptions carve out geological pipes made of a type of rock called kimberlite, named after the town of Kimberley in South Africa, where the first diamonds of this type of rock were found. The diamond, along with magma from deep in the earth, then spews out through the kimberlite pipes onto the surface of the planet. For the most part, kimberlite pipes have been found around the edges of cratonic roots in places like parts of Canada, Siberia, Australia and of course South Africa. And so it makes sense that cratonic roots would contain some diamond in their makeup. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. What will be the longest lunar eclipse this century will take place on the evening of July the 27th and morning of July the 28th. It's the second total lunar eclipse this year, being visible across much of Australia, Asia, Africa, Europe and South America. Most of Africa, the Middle East and all of India will get the best view, with totality lasting 103 minutes. And the further away you are from there, the less you'll get to see, with Australia, New Zealand, Europe, Western Africa, South America, Eastern and Southeast Asia all getting a partial eclipse. The spectacle will begin at 1714 Greenwich Mean Time on the afternoon of July the 27th. That's 3.14 in the morning of July the 28th, Australian Eastern Standard Time. With a full eclipse occurring at 19.30 in the evening Greenwich Mean Time, that's 5.30 in the morning Australian Eastern Standard Time, just before sunrise. A total lunar eclipse occurs when the Sun, Earth and Moon all align. During the event, the Moon passes completely through the Earth's dark shadow or umbra. Even though the Earth completely blocks out sunlight from directly reaching the surface of the Moon, the Moon is still visible during a total lunar eclipse. You'll see the Moon will gradually get darker. 
It'll then take on a rusty or even blood red colour as light from the sun reflects through Earth's atmosphere and undergoes regularly scattering, leaving only the longer red wavelengths as all of Earth's sunrises and sunsets happen at once to indirectly reflect onto the lunar surface. A total lunar eclipse can also look yellow, orange or even brown in colour, depending on how different types of dust, particles and clouds in Earth's atmosphere allow different wavelengths of light to reach the lunar surface. Oh, and one other good thing about a lunar eclipse, you don't need any special glasses to view it. Dr Brad Tucker from the Australian National University says there's still lots of stuff we can learn from a total lunar eclipse. The reason it's red is that we're seeing a little bit of light still go through the atmosphere of the Earth and then project it out into space. Now, if you change the composition of the atmosphere of the Earth, you will actually change that red effect. So if there's ash clouds or dust, you actually change how much of that light is refracted and therefore what color will end up being projected onto the moon. Now, this is a good a case of showing the technique that we use and testing the technique we use for actually other planets. So the way we're trying to measure the atmospheres of planets around other stars is the exact same technique. See how much light from the host star goes through that planet's atmosphere and then beams all the way out into space that then falls on our cameras to detect it. So it's a good way of not only figuring out what's going on in our Earth's atmosphere, but also calibrating or checking our techniques for doing this around planets around other stars. Now, one of the, the strongest evidences early on of the Earth being curved was actually something using a lunar eclipse. Still good to be able to see things, I think, for your eyes and show the phenomenon or some of these features that we talk about, but also in real time with your own eyes. So it's a good it's a good explaining tool for some of the more research things that we do that are essentially the same technique, and that is transiting planets and finding planets that go around other stars. And of course, the big thing about this particular eclipse is that it's the longest this century. That's right. So in some parts of the world, it's going to be the for o almost two hours. Now, um, for most part of Australia, um, we won't see the entire eclipse. So what we'll see is we'll see the all the way up to totality when the moon goes fully into the Earth's shadow, but we won't see the moon pass out of the Earth's shadow and the eclipse end, and that's because the sun is rising. Those in the west part of Australia should see nearly all of the eclipse, and in some parts of the world it's going to be so long it will be, as I said, almost two hours for totality. And okay. the difference in the length between some totalities which are longer and others which are shorter. So yeah, I, I think this is kind of one of those cool things that goes into the inherent reason why we we always don't get eclipses. So the orbit of the moon around the Earth is not perfect. It varies by about 50,000 kilometers. It also varies in its degree. Sometimes it's right around and flat in the disk, as we say, in an in alignment, so to speak. And that's when we get a total lunar eclipse. But it also varies by about five degrees. So if you're a little bit further out, then your shadow or your eclipse will last a different time than if you're closer by 50,000 kilometers. So when the moon is on average 30, 350,000 kilometers away, that variation is actually a significant distance or difference, and that's going to affect how long the eclipse is. And conversely, it will affect the length of a total solar eclipse if we were to see one. Because keep in mind, in, our, in the future, when we have our lunar residents, they will be getting a total solar eclipse right now. And speaking of total solar eclipses, normally we find a lunar eclipse occurring two weeks before or after a solar eclipse. So there was a brief solar eclipse two weeks ago uh, or, or a half a lunar cycle ago, and the just essentially it landed in the part of the Earth where no one lives, and that is to the southeast of Tasmania. So parts of Tasmania got a little bit of a partial solar eclipse. I think about 8% of the sun was blocked. In some, most cases, people didn't even notice it because totality happened over the Southern Ocean. So while there was a solar eclipse that preceded this lunar eclipse, not many people watched it, maybe a few penguins. That's Dr. Brad Tucker from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that climate change could cause tropical cyclones, hurricanes and typhoons to threaten new regions previously thought out of reach. The findings reported in the journal Nature Climate Change claim cities that were once considered to be too far north or south to be hit by cyclones to be increasingly at risk as climatic conditions that favour cyclone formation are shifting away from the equator towards the poles. 
The researchers found that climate change-induced tropical expansion is set to continue towards the poles, and the results suggest people in those areas should expect increasing cyclone, hurricane or typhoon-related hazards. Humans have now been identified as a major hub for the superbug bacteria Staphylococcus aureus, commonly known as Golden Staph. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, Ecology and Evolution, suggest that human interactions with livestock have provided opportunities for the bugs to switch hosts, jumping from cows to humans. They've also found that industrialised agriculture, including the use of antibiotics and feed supplements in intensive farming, has directly influenced the evolution of golden staff, leading to antibiotic resistance which is now threatening public health and food security. A new study claims radiation from cell phones may affect memory performance in adolescents. The research by the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute looked at the relationship between exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields from wireless communication devices and memory performance in teenagers. The data examined exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields and the development of memory performance in 700 teens aged 12 to 17 living in both urban and rural Swiss German speaking areas over the course of a year. They found that cumulative radio frequency electromagnetic field exposure from cell phones could have a negative effect on the development of figural memory performance in adolescents. Figural memory is mainly located in the right brain hemisphere, and association with radio frequency electromagnetic fields was more pronounced in kids using mobile phones on the right side of their head. However, a couple of important points to remember. Firstly, the research didn't include the likely influence of other factors, such as puberty, which affects both phone usage rates and the participant's cognitive and behavioural state. And there was no control factor, such as kids who never use mobile phones. After all, there ain't many Amish in the Swiss Alps. A new study suggests the Australian native dog the dingo may have arrived in country far more recently than previously thought. While earlier research estimated the dogs first arrived in southern Australia between four and 5,000 years ago, the new findings in the journal Scientific Reports have determined that dingoes first arrived between 3,348 and 3,081 years ago. Previous estimates of how long dingoes arrived on Aussie shores varied widely, that's because they were based on archaeological deposit dates and genetic differences rather than on dingo bones themselves. The timing of the arrival of the dingo is important because they help transform indigenous societies across mainland Australia. And they've also been implicated in the extinction of a number of animals, including the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger. This study provides direct dating of dingo bones from their oldest known archaeological context in the Medora Cave on the Nullarbor Plain in southern Western Australia, and so are the oldest known dingo bones ever found. New cell phones from BlackBerry and Samsung are getting people all excited, offering bigger screens, better cameras and other new features. But are they really new or just an incremental increase? With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahar of Reut, from IT Wire. BlackBerry's phone has actually gone on sale just recently. This is called the Key 2, although there is actually a thing called the BlackBerry Ghost coming with a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, which will give you a lot of battery life. I'm looking at the BlackBerry Ghost, and it looks like a giant iPhone or, or, or Android phone, but the BlackBerry Key 2, of course, has the famous keyboard that Blackberries are, are well known for. And this one is an upgrade on the Key 1 that came out last year. The keys are supposed to be 20% taller and easier to type on. And... Um, you know, there's reports of two and a half days of battery life, and of course you get the extra security uh, enhancements that BlackBerry still boasts over traditional Android devices. And for those who love their old Blackberries, well, the the brand is still going strong, and uh, it's still you know out there, and you know with all the uh, na- you know now running Android as opposed to its own operating system. And there's supposed to be Oreo upgrades to that particular BlackBerry soon, although the world of Android will soon be going to Android P. We don't know what P is going to stand for, P can tie or something else, we're not sure. But the other big thing in the world of uh, Android smartphones is the Samsung Galaxy Note 9. Now, all the big improvements are supposed to be coming with the S10 series sometime early next year. So the, the Note 9 looks to be an upgraded Note 8 with a faster Qualcomm 845 processor, the big processor of the moment. And uh, that's for the US. Other countries around the world will get the Exynos processor, which is Samsung's equivalent. And uh, Samsung, uh, a lot of the stats actually say the Exynos is faster, but it's basically got the same power. And there'll be different colors available, better resolution, uh, better, you know, high quality cameras and 
apparently the rumors say a 6.4 inch screen instead of a 6.3 inch screen and also the fingerprint reader will be under the camera as opposed to on the left hand side of it as it currently is which of course gets people to accidentally touch the the camera and smudge it up that was something that was fixed on the s9 and so people are expecting it to be fixed on the the note 9 as well and a lot of the note 9 teaser sort of information has has focused on a yellow pen now whether this means the stylus is going to get extra features or it's just a hint to the fact there's going to be other colors with the note nine as opposed to sort of the black and silver and you know the blue or gold or you know whatever colors they normally come out with there'll be more of them so whether this is going to be the, the a huge big change or just sort of a more incremental update is yet to be seen but the rumors point to be it to be being more incremental which will be happy for some who will want to upgrade off older devices and for others it'll say give them a reason to not upgrade until next year alex sahar of Reut from it wire reporting you're listening to space time i'm Stuart gary and that's the show for now You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 